Testimony Treasures, Volume 2, Chapter 6, Will a Man Rob God? The Lord has made the diffusion of light and truth in the earth dependent on the voluntary efforts and offerings of those who have been partakers of the heavenly gifts. Comparatively few are called to travel as ministers or missionaries, but multitudes are to cooperate in spreading the truth with their means. The history of Ananias and Sapphira is given us that we may understand the sin of deception in regard to our gifts and offerings. They had voluntarily promised to give a portion of their property for the promotion of the cause of Christ. But when the means was in their hands, they declined to fulfill that obligation, at the same time wishing it to appear to others that they had given all. Their punishment was marked in order that it might serve as a perpetual warning to Christians of all ages. The same sin is fearfully prevalent at the present time, yet we hear of no such signal punishment. The Lord shows men once with what abhorrence He regards such an offense against His sacred claims and dignity, and then they are left to follow the general principles of the divine administration. Voluntary offerings and the tithe constitute the revenue of the gospel. Of the means which is entrusted to man, God claims a certain portion, a tithe. But He leaves all free to say how much the tithe is, and whether or not they will give more than this. They are to give as they purpose in their hearts. But when the heart is stirred by the influence of the Spirit of God— and a vow is made to give a certain amount, the one who vowed has no longer any right to the consecrated portion. He has given his pledge before men, and they are called to witness to the transaction. At the same time, he has incurred an obligation of the most sacred character to cooperate with the Lord in building up his kingdom on earth. Promises of this kind made to men would be considered binding. Are they not more sacred and binding when made to God? Are promises tried in the court of conscience less binding than written agreements with men? When the divine light is shining into the heart with unusual clearness and power, habitual selfishness relaxes its grasp, and there is a disposition to give to the cause of God. None need expect that they will be allowed to fulfill the promises then made without a protest on the part of Satan. He is not pleased to see the Redeemer's kingdom on earth built up. He suggests that the pledge made was too much, that it may cripple them in their efforts to acquire property or gratify the desires of their families. The power Satan has over the human mind is wonderful. He labors most earnestly to keep the heart bound up in self. The only means which God has ordained to advance His cause is to bless men with property. He gives them the sunshine and the rain. He causes vegetation to flourish. He gives health and ability to acquire means. All our blessings come from His bountiful hand. In turn, he would have men and women show their gratitude by returning him a portion in tithes and offerings, in thank offerings, in free will offerings, in trespass offerings. The hearts of men become hardened through selfishness, and, like Ananias and Sapphira, they are tempted to withhold part of the price while pretending to come up to the rules of tithing. Will a man rob God? Should means flow into the treasury exactly according to God's plan, a tenth of all the increase, there would be abundance to carry forward His work. Well, says one, the calls keep coming to give to the cause. I am weary of giving. Are you? Then let me ask, are you weary of receiving from God's beneficent hand? Not until He ceases to bless you will you cease to be under the bonds to return to Him the portion He claims. He blesses you that it may be in your power to bless others. When you are weary of receiving, then you may say, I am weary of so many calls to give. God reserves to Himself a portion of all that we receive. When this is returned to Him, the remaining portion is blessed. 
but when it is withheld, the whole is sooner or later cursed. God's claim is first. Every other is secondary. Remember the poor. In every church there should be established a treasury for the poor. Then let each member present a thank offering to God once a week or once a month, as is most convenient. This offering will express our gratitude for the gifts of health, of food, and of comfortable clothing. And according as God has blessed us with these comforts, will we lay by for the poor, the suffering, and the distressed. I would call the attention of our brethren especially to this point. Remember the poor. Forego some of your luxuries, yea, even comforts, and help those who can obtain only the most meager food and clothing. In doing for them, you are doing for Jesus in the person of his saints. He identifies himself with suffering humanity. Do not wait until your imaginary wants are all satisfied. Do not trust to your feelings and give when you feel like it and withhold when you do not feel like it. Give regularly, either ten, twenty, or fifty cents a week, as you would like to see upon the heavenly record in the day of God. Your good wishes we will thank you for, but the poor cannot keep comfortable on good wishes alone. They must have tangible proofs of your kindness in food and clothing. God does not mean that any of his followers should beg for bread. He has given you an abundance that you may supply those of their necessities which, by industry and economy, they are not able to supply. Do not wait for them to call your attention to their needs. Act as did Job. The thing that he knew not, he searched out. Go on an inspecting tour and learn what is needed and how it can be best supplied. Robbing the Lord I have been shown that many of our people are robbing the Lord in tithes and in offerings, and as the result, His work is greatly hindered. The curse of God will rest upon those who are living upon God's bounties and yet close their hearts and do nothing or next to nothing to advance His cause. Brothers and sisters, how can the beneficent Father continue to make you His stewards furnishing you with means to use for Him when you grasp it all, selfishly claiming that it is yours. Instead of rendering to God the means He has placed in their hands, many invest it in more land. This evil is growing with our brethren. They had before all they could well care for, but the love of money or a desire to be counted as well off as their neighbors leads them to bury their means in the world and withhold from God His just dues. Can we be surprised if they are not prospered? If God does not bless their crops and they are disappointed? Could our brethren remember that God can bless twenty acres of land and make them as productive as one hundred, they would not continue to bury themselves in lands, but would let their means flow into God's treasury. Take heed, said Christ, lest at any time your hearts be overcharged with surfeiting and drunkenness and cares of this life. Satan is pleased to have you increase your farms and invest your means in worldly enterprises. For by so doing, you will not only hinder the cause from advancing, but by anxiety and overwork, lessen your prospect for eternal life. We ought now to be heeding the injunction of our Savior. Sell that ye have, and give alms. Provide yourselves bags which wax not old, a treasure in the heavens that faileth not. It is now that our brethren should be cutting down their possessions instead of increasing them. We are about to move to a better country, even a heavenly then let us not be dwellers upon the earth, but be getting things into as compact a compass as possible. The time is coming when we cannot sell at any price. The decree will soon go forth, prohibiting men to buy or sell of any man, save him that hath the mark of the beast. The Lord has shown me repeatedly that it is contrary to the Bible to make any provision for our temporal wants in the time of trouble. I saw that if the saints had food laid up by them, or in the field in the time of trouble, when sword, famine, and pestilence are in the land, 
it would be taken from them by violent hands, and strangers would reap their fields. Then will be the time for us to trust wholly in God, and He will sustain us. I saw that our bread and water will be sure at that time, and that we shall not lack or suffer hunger, for God is able to spread a table for us in the wilderness. If necessary, He would send ravens to feed us, as He did to feed Elijah, or rain manna from heaven, as He did for the Israelites. Houses and lands will be of no use to the saints in the time of trouble, for they will then have to flee before infuriated mobs, and at that time their possessions cannot be disposed of to advance the cause of present truth. I was shown that it is the will of God that the saints should cut loose from every encumbrance before the time of trouble comes and make a covenant with God through sacrifice. If they have their property on the altar and earnestly inquire of God for duty, He will teach them when to dispose of these things. Then they will be free in the time of trouble and have no clogs to weigh them down.